Thank you all. Thank you very much for being all here. I thank uh, David for inviting me during this uh, conference, which brings me back uh, some years now, 10, in fact, because I left China in 2004. Uh, so uh, China has changed a lot, because China changes a lot all the time. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do um, I'll both uh, explain what was the job there and uh, why and how uh, we uh, studied this. A small presentation on who I am. As David said, I'm a sociologist. I am a researcher in a public French research institute called the IRD, Institut de Recherche pour le Développement. And I have been hired some 30 years ago to set up a team that still exists uh, on science policies and <coughs> scientific uh, communities in the developing world. Uh, the idea was and is still to study the institutional aspects of how science research innovation is uh, understood in uh, a variety of countries, depending on the context we have with. And uh, as a result, I've been 10 years in Latin America, in fact, four in Venezuela and six in Mexico. And after that, I went to China four years, from 2000 to 2004. And since 2004, I'm working in what's called the Mediterranean region, which is a pretty name, name the Arab countries that are uh, on the coast of the Mediterranean. I'm, and I've been three years in Lebanon. I come back from Lebanon, in fact, and uh, so I reintegrate somehow the French system. That's me. Uh, the topics I've been working on is more or less uh, all around the same issue, which is uh, the connection between research and uh, production, research and innovation, research and the uses of research results. Uh, this topic is by itself uh, an issue uh, in all science research policies in all countries where uh, public funding has to answer to the question, what do you research for and why should we pay for you? There's another issue which is uh, scientists themselves, researchers in academic environments, need to integrate somehow the demands that come from society. There's a variety of ways you do this. Some ways are more through companies, other are through institutional linkages, other contexts are through um, <coughs> the what's called the civil society. The dose and the orientations between these different ways demands are expressed towards the scientific system are different. It's always an issue to know where the impulse comes, if it comes from the research part or if it comes from, from the uh, rest of the society, of the non-research part. But the main aspect that interests us here and that's been part of the research we, that we did in China also, is that um, in fact the academic world is a social world by itself and the other worlds that interact with it are also social worlds. So the connections, the linkages are constructed. That just not a question of offer and demand. You are not in a relation where you have a product which would be knowledge that can be sold and bought. Something similar happens to technology. It's good to remember that in the 70s, <coughs> until probably the end of the 70s, there was in the national and international organizations that were uh, about working on industrialization, there was this issue that technology transfers should be regulated as a market and that you would somehow be able to buy the technology integrated in the companies and, and in, in some way regulate the way you use it, legally, economically. That would mean that you have packages of technology, and mainly in Latin America has been the great, the great uh, user of this uh, theoretical framework. It was called El Paquete Tecnologico in, in, in Latin America, it was called like that. 
The idea was you have packages of technology that are transmitted through foreign direct investment that foreign companies or brokers of technology more and more. And then that these you buy a sort of package, so as a bad book, and then inside there are instructions on how you use the bloody thing, and then you produce, and then you sell the end product. Okay, that was the idea. And in fact, uh, sociologists and economists, mainly sociologists in the late 70s, beginning 80s, published a lot of case studies where they show very clearly that this is not the case. That what happens is that you have to somehow integrate the technology not by buying it, but by assimilating it. So you might buy it, you might steal it, you might copy it, you might reverse engineer it, you might do a lot of things with it by bits and parts. You never buy a total package, you always buy parts of that, and the parts you buy correspond to the types of competences you develop inside the companies or inside the places where you produce it. That, ha that's, that has an important caveat. It changes completely the, the view, because then you don't have a market for technology. You have, for example, a market for uh, issues that of proprietary. Who belong, to whom does such and such bit and part of the technology belong to? Is this artificial silicia, when it is used in such part, in such type of uh, circuit, belongs to Intel, or does it belong to somebody else? does such and such bit of this computer, it probably has around 3,000 patents around it. Uh, but the only persons who know how to do it is the, the persons who designed it. So you might be the owner of the 3,000 patents, buy all of them, and not be able to assemble this thing. Because you don't only buy the parts of the technology that the patents are, are designed for, to protect for, but also the institutional and economic assemblage that goes around it, the, the, the way the institutions construct together. This uh, generality is to introduce the idea that this assimilation of technology is the real motor, the real engine, sorry, of, 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 of the technological development. Uh, and it means that you have to look at the experiences that you have by managing the technology. What I'm telling you here, at the beginning of the 80s, appeared like a very heterodox and very, very absurd, to say the truth. When you were going to an economist and talk to him about technology and the development of technology, first of all, technology was not part of the economic model. Second, all this bullshit about technology is this complicated aspect. That just technology should manage that. It has nothing to do with the development of the economy. So when you are beginning to talk about, no, the integration of technology is an important part of it, and then you have to understand what's the process by which you integrate it. This appeared as really a sort of very obscure black box. So the idea in the 80s was to open this black box, and the main concept that I used with the people I worked with was the concept of technological learning. The idea was that through the experiences a social actor has, it assimilates the technology and the way to use it, by way of consequence, the way to produce it also, to manage it, <coughs> to organize around it. This technological learning so is cumulative, first characteristic, on time. So the more you get, the more you have. You can forget also in the time, because in the process you need to forget from time to time. You have some sort of routines that organize around the way you assimilate things. Um, so a second characteristic, it has its rather idiosyncratic. That means that with the same bits and parts and the same end product, you can have very different ways of producing things. This idiosyncrasy of the technological learning makes it very complicated to reproduce. It means that the recipe I can invent for company A will not work for company B. It also means that the institution that has designed a certain set of policies to support the pr projection or the transfer of specific technology will not work in the same way with other types of actors. So what you would need then is to build up the interaction, 
not to design a channel by which then you suppose that every time you reproduce the same way of doing things. Channeling from location A to location B to the technology. We had very good examples of this idiosyncrasy uh, by looking at how a, a robot that was in Argentina, uh, there was two robots that uh, came more or less at the same time, in 80, it was in 88, uh, the, in uh, robots that were helping the production as the assembly line of a uh, washing machine. <coughs> so there was a company that was in Tierra de Fuego in the complete yeah, in the south of Argentina. You're from there? <laughs> no? But very, very, very far away. And, and there was, uh, which was there because it was a free economic zone, so they didn't pay uh, taxes for to produce there. That's why it was an industrial uh, zone that had a lot of investments of companies. And there was a quite large Argentinian company with national capital that was setting up these washing machines for the Latin American market, South American market. Uh, this, this, this robot they had bought uh, was had a software that was designed in Denver by an American small design company. And um, the same company exposed the, the robot. The robot it's, 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 sort of, it's a sort of hand, you know, an articulated hand that just does this. It's, it doesn't have a head and all that, just a hand. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, it picks apart, it puts it there, and it does this beautifully, much better than anybody could do that. Uh, so the, the same robot was, uh, the same model was presented in a, um, a commercial fair in Buenos Aires, to show, that's sort of, they were showing their full profit. It had costed so expensively to bring it to the, to the fair and all that, that the company decided to let it there and give it as a gift to whomever wanted to take it away. Because it's heavy, it's complicated, you had to pay taxes, or whatever. And there was a, a company doing also washing machines that bought it, well, for free. They took it from the fair, they put it in their, in their uh, shop workshop. The robot had a default design in the software. Nobody knew about it, not even the people who designed it. But after two or three months in Tierra del Fuego, who had paid very expensively to set up this robot, the robot Berserk does not work. Same things happened in the Buenos larger Buenos Aires area where the, the other robot was, and it was probably for the same reason. The robot, after three months, finished. Doesn't work. What was this is the end of the story. The story is that the people in Tierra del Fuego, they phoned to a guy called Harry, who was somewhere in the United States, and they tell him that the robot does not work, and say, can you send me a fax with what's happening, with what, where's the machine, how it is, where it stopped, how it did, blah, blah. and they begin to exchange. They knew each other very well. Why? Because the people from the US had come there to set up the robot, and they had had this very intense experience of setting up the technology. Installation thing, meaning learning how to use the thing, uh, try not to, 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 to do things that you were not supposed to do, and so on and so forth. So there was a very intense period of installing the technology the productive, uh, which part of it was the, this robot. With all the changes that also were implied by the fact that it was a CNC machine, so you had, you had all these commands, electronic commands that nobody knew really how to use at that time. It was, I mean, it was not the same thing as before. So they really had to learn how to do this. And they had spent some 15 days or three, months, three weeks with, me, with the guys who were technicians like themselves, same social condition, one's Americans, the other, the other Argentinian, working together, very happy, and they had made friends and talked about everything, and like good much or Latin Americans, they had brought the, the guys to, to drink and talk about women and all these kind of things. So there was a sort of social understanding there, a group, like, a social group that was created there. 
So the, the process that took something like one week to fix the machine was complicated because, in fact, it needed a redesign of the, of the part of the software, which is not an easy thing. They had to go to the people who had done the design of the software, which were not the same ones as the ones who had done the integration of the design to the robot, and so on and so forth. So you had all this line of providers and clients that were fit together by the social, very informal system, which is the shop work where the, the engine was, the people who had designed the technology, and so on and so forth. The robot in Buenos Aires never worked. The one in Tierra del Fuego worked again and lived for some 10 years assembling washing machines. It's a good example of the fact that to make a technology work, you need this social substrate. You need this interaction of between. It also explains the story about idiosyncrasy. Why is it so different from one environment to the other environment? And examples like that, whenever you go to a company inside a workshop and you look at a technology working, a productive technology working, it's exactly the same thing. It expresses differently, but you always have this spe specific internal technological learning, people accumulating knowledge, learning how to use the thing, making a social arrangement around the technology and working together. So I said that it's cumulative, <coughs> it's idiosyncratic, and it's also, I, I just demonstrated it with a small example, collective. The fact that it's collective is important because it's a collective that makes the thing work. It doesn't mean that everybody cooperates in there. It just means that there's a lot of people involved. And somehow they are assembled. And there's, there's an issue about how much cooperation and how much collaboration between the teams and so on. It's a management issue. You'll, 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 you'll find tons of papers on that, on how much collaboration, how much. It's not particularly interesting to my eyes. Either you manage a team or you don't, and you can have also better managed a variety of teams instead of one, if the thing is big. I think it's a physical issue. It's not so much uh, different than, than other general generic management questions. But the fact that it's a collective venture is important. And it's a collective venture in two different meanings. First of all, because of its internal organization. Uh, when uh, Danone installed the first uh, yogurt plant in Mexico, it was in a market where yogurt was not a product, because Mexicans were not eating so much yogurt at that time. Uh, it was producing with a highly automatized machine uh, plant, where uh, most of the workers did not know how to write or read, uh, and this, w it was a reproduction of a plan they had in Strasbourg, which was their best plan in the beginning of the 80s, uh, that was doing the same type of yogurts. The one in Strasbourg was most of the time with problems, organizational, technological, and so on and so forth. The one in Mexico had never, no problem. And it gave, it gave uh, a very good uh, PhD thesis of a sociologist of work on why it worked. Among the things of why it worked is because the collective functioning of the groups there was much stronger. The interaction of the groups were much stronger than it was in France. And in many senses, this internal cohesion was probably more, more important because then you did not need to have people to know how to, to read them the instructions. They need how to do the thing. And, and progressively, this changed. But I the, 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 the initiation of the process was, was like that. So I said collective in two meanings. One as internal, this internal meaning. And the second one is external. And there where, where China comes in. The external thing is that um, this learning process uh, has to use the inputs from outside. You don't learn things that you just know already. No? You learn things that come from somewhere. It can be a teacher, it can be a book, it can be an instruction, it can be a machine, it can be you copy something. But then this, the way you 
channel from outside to inside is probably very critical. So if you do it in a way that is, as we did with Harry in Tierra del Fuego, with the robot and so on, with a very intense social interaction, then you would probably have more reasons to have this internal development process of the technology to be stable, solid. Whereas uh, if it's in a more haphazard way or in a more market uh, change, where you buy a specific input and you try to use it, then it would be much more difficult, in part because you need how to learn how to use that. We had a nice, I had a nice example when I was doing field work in Mexico with uh, some guys who were developing a surfactant in, in chemical processes. It was a sort of additive you put to oil so that it was making more smoother the, 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 the the glue, the, it's like so the internal glue of the, of the polymers that were extracted out of, of, uh, of petroleum. Um, so they knew how to do this, this, this additive, they knew how to produce it by synthesis, and they knew how to integrate it in the different chemical products they wanted to integrate it. And to be really uh, economically feasible uh, it needed to be on a large scale, like a continuous process, where you have a machine that regulates temperature, pressure, and speed, and all that, with very little intervention from, from persons physically on the, on the line, <coughs> production line. Of course, you could do it by a batch process, where somebody takes a pot, adds it, mixes it, puts it on the side, waits uh, 24 hours, takes it back, and so on and so forth. And that's how they were doing it, in fact. They had invented the production line that was doing it all that, that could do it all automatically. They didn't never do it. They never implemented it in their own, in their own fabric. And the reason for that is the market is not big enough. They had not enough clients to sell this. So what's the problem? Why well, produce something that you cannot sell? But they had uh, showed that in some fair. Industrial fairs are very important for industrial companies. They had, they had shown that in an industrial fair. And there was a Korean guy who was doing the same kind of additives and all that, who was very much interested by that. And he said, I buy the technology. He said, no, you just pay us, we just install the technology, you pay us the license, then it's fine with us. It's a good, for us, it's a, it's a good solution because we need to use it on a batch process. You can use it as we designed it. For us, it's enough. It's, it's, we gain prestige in the market, and you are our showcase. So they spent some two months in Korea, and they had fun in Korea installing the, the, the technology. By the way, they developed another technology by installing this one. Uh, again, changing with the Korean company who had other competences in other areas. Again, the interaction and the process of interacting with the companies on specific issues where the kind of knowledge you can acquire cannot be designed, cannot be described before you actually do it. Which is one of the interesting aspects of technology, by and large. You can't know beforehand what's happening. You'll, you'll know it on the spot. So we have sort of an internal learning process and external learning process. Of course, it's a caricature to say it like that, but you understood the, 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 the general meaning. So when we set up this team with the Chinese uh, university in Zhongshan University in the south of China, the idea was to try to understand industrialization of the south of China, who was responsible for 60% of exports at that time in the, in the region of Guangdong, you know better than me, uh, and we were uh, and we were um, supposed to do uh, field studies and case studies, going to see companies, trying to understand what was happening inside the companies, with the vague idea that if we go and see what the companies do, we would understand the industrialization process as a whole. I'm still not sure, so I'm going to discuss that with you today. I'm very happy to do that. So what's happening? Um, we went to see some 30 and so companies in three years. 
uh, with uh, the more or less the, the setup was the same. You had one or two professors of economics or sociology or management or whatever uh, with um, a bunch of students, two, three, four, sometimes 15, um, going to see a company which was very, very happy, were introduced usually by the local governments by the municipality, the village, uh, or the canton, the local, the local, uh, the local government. Uh, we were sort of uh, right hand for the government of the, the of of uh, the province of Guangdong because we had um, the the general hat under which we were uh, acting was the uh, Institute for the Development of the Guangdong Region, which was invented by professors of the University Zhongshan University in a collaboration with the municipality of Canton, of the city, and of the local government of the province. And so the contact was through students, former students, or engineers, or laobans, or bosses of companies that have had contacts with the university at some time, and that were very happy to invite Professor so-and-so to visit his uh, company. So this was the setup. And it explains why we could visit a lot of companies, because I think that at that time at least, very few, and still today, very few foreigners have visited private Chinese companies or semi-private or whatever, collective companies or red hat companies or whatever companies you want, concretely by going in the workshops and working with the people inside the company. So it was interesting to see uh, as this, that the process by which we study the thing is also a social process. Um, and we visited a series of companies, and usually and in the paper I, I sent to you, I think there's, there's four or five that were explained, but it was more like the generalizations of the companies. There's another, there's another paper uh, that I think was published in 2006, which was called Technological Learning in Six Firms in Southern China. Uh, which describes a little more, more in detail the six, six of the best cases we had. In fact, we selected these six out of many that we did because they were exemplifying uh, three different models. One model is um, the collective company that uh, belonged to the former socialist economy that grew out of economic growth and becomes a private company or a market company, <coughs> but still is there, exists there. Mind you that this is not a detail because most of the, com for example, Hire or Conca or uh, another, many of the companies that are still unknown now, uh, Lenovo is also, is also a collective company. Uh, and Lenovo was also not only a collective company, it was also the research and, and development department of a public company, in fact. And it was like an independent structure that was then transformed in a company and, and grew out as a company. Uh, something similar happens in other companies, like um, Huawei, for example, was also a company that was created as a R&D department. Sanjo also, which is pharmaceuticals, and is also in the same, same, kind of, same, same kind of model. So this collective type of companies, companies that had the status of a, of a local governmental company, uh, grew in the process of reform after the, after the, the beginning of the 80s, as in the same way as a private company. And they were managed in the same way. There was a bunch of American anthropologists that were, anthropologists that were circulating in, in China and that had the argument that in the 80s and the 90s, so practically for some 20 years in China, the bosses of the public companies were the ones who had the show, who made the show in China. And they were the ones who were setting the rules, not only in terms of uh, the market and economy, but also all the rules about how economic institutions should be. 
And it's very much one of the examples that we are, we are, we are uh, seeing there. Another, another case is this uh, washing machine chimney, uh, which is based in uh, Jiangmen city, which is a small city not far away from, from uh, the capital of Guangdong, um, some 150 kilometers from there, which uh, today has been bought by an Italian uh, company. But initially, it was machine uh, washing machines and uh, other uh, this kind of uh, electronic electric uh, machinery. And uh, was a quite nice uh, company. Salaries were higher. It had good condition. Was protected by the local government of Jiangmen, which is a very rich government because it owns a lot of uh, districts, industrial districts that are very rich because a lot of companies are installed there and pay taxes. And then, uh, probably China is one of the a very few countries in the world where uh, when you pay a lot of taxes, we're proud of it. So you have a plate in the entrance of a company saying that you are the high taxpayer. So you belong to those who really pr make this city prosper. I don't think there's any other country in the world that does that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so Jiangmen government was a rich government and supported this, uh, this, this company, which uh, did something very strange. They, they, they were doing uh, uh, air condition units, standard air condition units, like everybody's uh, producing now, which are all Chinese, as you know now. And uh, they were among the first ones to produce this. And they, instead of doing it themselves, they, they they asked Mitsubishi <coughs> to come and produce it in China for them. So Mitsubishi, for Mitsubishi, uh, air condition is zero in there. It's a gigantic company. It makes satellites, uh, arm systems, uh, electronic machinery, uh, telecommunications. Mitsubishi does, for them, air condition is, is a very small business. But for the Chinese company that had been sort of um, inviting Mitsubishi to produce a small unit in the south of China. For them, it was a big business. And what they were doing? Well, the Japanese, in fact, had installed inside the company another company, their own company, with only, at the beginning, Japanese managers. After four or five years, they had the Japanese managers went back to, to Japan, were replaced by Chinese managers. And the whole thing was a sort of living example for, the, for all the other activities inside the company. So all the other production. So they were looking how the Japanese were doing and copying what the Japanese were doing in, their, in the other parts of the, of the company. They became so good that General Electric for some time had a, a, a joint venture with them to develop specific parts of, of washing machines for the Brazilian market, which was a funny, no, it was, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, yeah, maybe it was the Brazilian market, some market in, in, in South America. And, uh, and in fact, the contact there was through General Electric, who had this production unit, doing the same kind of washing machines as Jingling was producing in China. So the idea was to sort of develop the technology in China and re-export it in, in Brazil. So you see that we are not simply in copying technologies. General Electric has no real interest in developing sort of basic, very common technology, but which needs some integration of know-how that goes well beyond what you manage inside a workshop. So the specific control for the washing machine with General Electric, I remember at that time they developed it with the with an agreement with professors of mathematics in a university in Beijing, which is 3,000 kilometers from where we were. Uh, but at that place, there was a special mathematician that could uh, do this kind of calculation they needed to do the sec setup of this, uh, of this uh, small device. Um, so the, uh, the, the kind of technologies you integrate, the complexity you can integrate, gets bigger as along this process of learning more and, and accumulating more. Do I have talked too much? Is it okay? Um, no. 20, 20 minutes. It's okay? You're not too bored? <laughs> <laughs>
But you can interrupt me, no? If you're fed up, you tell me. Uh, uh, so, um, this was one of the, one of the process of learning, of trying to integrate a foreign company inside. Another, another model was in, um, which has been probably 80%, maybe 90%, we could never calculate how much, but a lot of the examples we had in Guangdong. It's a small private company that grows out practically nowhere. What's the practically nowhere? In fact, it's workers from some collective industry. Uh, we had a good example with the uh, faucets, the No, no. Yes. Okay. Faucets are. Um, it's not a very high technology, no. It's becoming higher because now you have electro thing devices and to control mm -hmm. fatigue, cold, and all that. But basically, it's opening uh, a valve, uh, installing a valve, casting a metal, and and doing the coating of a metal. So it's 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 a very basic technology. It's very useful, and it grows. It's a market that grows gigantically. Because when you had the development of China, all the buildings, well, they had thousands of tubes and faucets everywhere, so well. So there was a small city uh, called Chueco, which uh, was an industrial, uh, small industrial uh, city. In fact, it was uh, historically a place where they were doing uh, soya, soya um, sauce. You know the famous soy sauce. Oh, uh, that's what they were doing. Uh, and then, uh, at close to that, there was a very, very old company that existed in more than forty years. So it had, had lived through the revolution and the communist story and all that. Then it was doing faucets for gardens. You know, what, you know the one that gets out of the of the wall and just and breaks after six months. Well, that's that. What they were doing. And uh, they had, which meant that they had the know-how to cast air, iron. And I'm, I'm very sorry, at that time I had no machine to photograph because I think I visited the Les Fours de Dante, and the, the Inferno of Dante <laughs> with the, with the casting uh, kilns that were inside the, 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 the ground. And the casting was made by hand taking metal, putting it in the, in the fire, taking it out and casting the metal by hand. It was absolutely fantastic as, a, as, a, as an experience. It was quite a large company. It had some something like 300 workers. And when the, the reform, the economic reform entered, very quite, quite soon, quite quickly, um, because it's also a region of contraband and intense contacts with Hong Kong, it's it's it, it's 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 on the side of the of a river, and we had a lot of transfer and contacts, and and basically exports were done through by boat. Um, there was a lot of activity going on, economic activity. So a lot of the workers very quickly set up their own companies. So you had in in less than two or three years after the the law really was created. I think the first private company was in 84. And so uh, between 83 and 84, 84. And between 84 and 90, there were 50 companies that were created. So which means that you had a market, which means that you had free. And they all knew how to do the same thing, casting very artisanal, uh, very artisanal system. Some of these died very quickly. Some grew very quickly. Um, and so we visited uh, quite a, a bit of these companies in this village. This village is very representative of what happens in the south of China, because and, and, and in the coast of China, basically. You can find also all along the coast of China from south to north. A lot of these villages that are specialized in one specific industry, in one specific branch. And this is probably part of the story. So they all know how to do the same thing. They all compete, but the market is growing so quickly that they don't really mind. So if you manage to secure some workers, and if you manage to secure some money, 
you set up this thing and in two three years you become a company with a, with a showroom with a, and and trying to learn okay so how do you learn how to do better things than a tap that breaks after six months which, which is the point and it's generally the point when you develop a technology very quickly there the, the market 90% of the market, if not more, is a national market. It's not export market. But at some time, there appears some Spanish, some Italians who are in this kind of business, who want to produce cheap, and they've heard that in China you, can, you don't pay salaries, basically. <laughs> uh, at that time, when I did my interviews, mean salary of a worker in the region, it's doubled since then, but at that time it was 600 quai, which means 60, uh, 60 euros per month, no? more, to, more or less, which is not a lot. Uh, so, uh, so a lot of the companies, of the foreign companies came, and you had also a lot of foreigners, specifically in the south of China, in all the 80s and 90s, that are what we call buyers. People who go out there to just buy something. So they, look, they try to locate product, produ producers in whatever, and they buy and, and resell and in, in foreign markets. So most of these companies had been, at some moment or another, had been approached by one of these buyers saying, can you produce me one ton, two tons, three tons of these fossils? And some of them um, begin to produce for this new client, which is not a very important client in terms of money. He does not pay really much better than the Chinese clients uh, in the national market. Rather, it's rather worse. The, the only thing they like very much to have the foreign news because they can have them prices which are a little bit higher for reasons that have to do with the fact that they don't speak Chinese, they don't understand the markets, and so they don't know the prices either. And also, uh, in any case, whatever the price was lower than it was in Europe. And the other thing is that they, they could, with the foreigners, they could engage in a sort of discussion of what is the kind of product you need, which is something new for them. So in fact, this connection with the foreign market was not so much a connection for the money. It was a connection for the discussion of what is uh, faucet in your country. How do you do it? How do you develop? How do you cast the iron? Why do and then, after some time, some of these companies send one engineer in, in Europe, in some industrial fair in Europe. All the foreign companies bring in China some technicians that work in the companies, in the Chinese, uh, in the Chinese fabrics. In this exchange, their set up standards when you had no other institution setting the standards of the production, this was the only way to know what was the technological front of that. <coughs> and all the industrial cities that were in all around uh, the city of, of Canton, are all of them, <coughs> of Guangzhou, all of these, all of these cities all of these industrial, small industrial cities, very actively, the local governments very actively participated in helping the private companies get these contacts with foreigners. Again, the, the thing was not the money. The thing was get access to technology. And clients became more and more uh, technically uh, exigent, uh, sorry? Demanding. Demanding, yeah. They, they fixed more and more higher standards. They also explain how they do the control of quality for their production. They introduced ISO rules. They introduced re-engineering of the production processes. And relatively, in a relatively short period of time, you have examples of these small companies that grow from 50 workers 
badly paid, who know nothing, <coughs> to 300 workers who are, half of them, know the job, and when the issue is not so much um, what is uh, the market, because the market was always growing, but what is the technology. And, um, and this very close connection with the client is probably the secret of the development of all these private companies. It's not, it was not a, a process that was organized by local uh, governments. It was not a process that, but it was helped, it was fueled by local governments. It was not a process that was organized by or uh, came from the foreign uh, investment. It came usually from the same kind of companies in Europe, mostly in Europe and less in the US, in such a way that you have a whole bunch of a whole bunch of companies in the south of China, but also also in the east uh, coast of China, where uh, you have um, this interaction with the middle range quality products, middle price products, doing this kind of very uh, colloquial interaction with technicians that work locally and export alone. One of the cities we visited in Pingzhou was uh, um, a lot with companies that were uh, set up by Taiwanese uh, capitalists. Uh, one of them had bought the technical center of Pingzhou, the city of, of Pingzhou, which was a public venture, and had transformed that in a company. It didn't succeed at all. But was a, I mean, the, the process can be complicated. Another one of the companies was visited had something like uh, 15 uh, branches or 15 uh, fabrics with something like between 2,000 and 3,000 workers in each of them producing shoes, sport shoes. Sport market, the shoes, sport shoes is a fantastic it's market for that. Yeah. So, well, among the things that happen in these companies is that the foreign um, brands, they install their uh, quality control inside the fabrics. So there is a guy who's paid by Adidas, Prima, whatever. Uh, I didn't visit the ones with Nike, but uh, I suppose the same thing. Uh, they install uh, uh, on the fourth floor, usually, or the third floor, some floor. Um, a, a location where they do the quality control of the production and where there is an interaction with the, with the technical people of the company that goes very far beyond the quality control because it, it concerns also the design of the product, the type of material, what you buy as a material, where you buy it, what, what kind of uh, process can you use to, to make it quicker and so on and so forth. So this interaction is not superficial. It's very profound. And it's very fundamental for the company, even if the company sells mainly on the local market. Uh, as a proof that it's like that is that none of the companies we visited, and I think uh, Ernst, in his study he did in Taiwan, uh, observed the same thing. None of the companies have um, uh, exclusivity rights with uh, a producer or a brand. There's no, I think the case of Apple and, and, uh, and the company of, uh, which I forgot the name, uh, Foxconn, in, in, which is also in the region of Guangdong, is very exceptional uh, because it's, it's Apple. But as far as I know, when I was uh, in China, Intel, for example, 100 something like 150 providers in the region of Guangzhou. Uh, one of them is a company that broke, which was a public company in a city called uh, Jiao, Jiao Qi, Jiao Qi. Um, which was an old TV company that was transformed to an electronics company and then developed a specific uh, component that was bought by Intel to be integrated in microprocessors. Um, the, the issue for Intel was having 150 producers is, is too much and it was a logistic problem. How many trucks do I have out there that transport things for me? And is it, is it reasonable to have so many transportation issues and so on and so forth? So the, the kind of issues that are, were 
were there were not issues that had to do with uh, uh, strategies and so on. It was always uh, issues of getting things done, not 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 strategic uh, questions. But the local companies profited very much from this connection with their foreign clients, not providers, clients, and with this very close interaction with the clients. I think more or less this is what I wanted to tell you about the, the, the story about technological learning. There's a second part to that, but we can discuss it, which uh, I worked a lot with uh, <coughs> Chao Wei, which is my colleague, a Chinese colleague with whom I, we worked a lot. Uh, this, uh, um, the second part is on what type of policies have been designed to support this. As I told you, uh, I'm not going to go in details, just two, two ideas. One is a lot of this has been done with the local governments and not necessarily in accordance with what the central government in Beijing would think is useful for the development of the industrial development. One was that. The second thing, which uh, probably, so you had sort of duality between local policies and, 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 and national mm -hmm. policies. The second thing is that China designed a national innovation policy only somewhere in 2010. Um, it had, uh, I think, the first draft was something, the, the one that Wang Yuan wrote, which was the main writer of this policy, who was at the Center for Science Technology Policies in, <coughs> in Beijing. Um, and Dr. Wang Yuan, uh, what, he, what he tried to was to integrate ideas coming from the local, local governments and, and try to integrate them in a national innovation policy. Uh, but until 2010, there was no innovation, really, policy. There was a policy on research. There was a policy on research, public research, the, the, the marketization of, of public research centers that became private companies, most of them. Uh, there was a policy concerning the development of uh, infrastructures, and probably this has been a very efficient one. Um, but there was no really industrial policy in the, in that went beyond the public companies. So public companies had to follow some rules. The automobile, for example, you know, the sector, has been very much under this pressure of the national government, where the policy was to do joint ventures with foreign capital to develop local cars locally. But whenever you went in, in another sector than automobile, which was very specific, or the strategic technologies like satellites, telephone, and so on, there was no really policy from the government towards pushing for industry. Everything goes in this sector until the two years 2000. Local governments invented, most local governments in very active industrial regions like the ones I was telling you, developed what they call innovation centers. Innovation centers were technical centers where they were developing technologies for some company that says, I don't know how to do this, can you help me? And they bring, mm -hmm. they bring some people from outside and work together. They were as bad as the companies, and they knew as little as the companies. So really it was a process of learning for everybody, including the innovation centers. The deal for an innovation center was the following with the local government, was, and it's practically had been the same for all of these. The deal was, you have to be, we pay you for three years or two years, we pay for the salaries of the people and, the, and, the, and we give you a, a place to work. After two years, you have to be autonomous in terms of salaries. And after five years, you need to pay for the, for, for the whole of your expenses or you die. So um, in this process, there was something like uh, 50 innovation centers that were pushed by the government of Guangdong region, for example. The province of Guangdong promoted this kind actively. Of these, I heard of only 10 or 12 that prospered somehow. And uh, it's, uh, and probably still, ex uh, some of them exist still. Uh, but it's, it has been a very difficult process of interacting with the companies for the governments to promote specific specific technologies. It's 
but but the the idea was to have local technical competent centers that would help on specific issues for the for the companies this was not a national policy this was local policy and in the year 2000 there was this idea uh, 2010 there was this idea that the innovation policy of the whole country should have the same kind of rules but if you look at the details of the program you see that it's mainly an issue of coordinating different authorities ministry of finance of telecommunication of commerce of uh, in order to manage resources financial resources mainly towards the companies that want to develop new technologies that's, that's, that's more or less, the, in very brief terms, the issues on the policy aspects. <coughs> well. Thank you. So, thank you a lot for the presentation. And we had two papers of the professor. One was uh, this one about China, who explained a lot about the national system of innovation. And one was uh, indeed the L'apprentissage technologique des pays émergents. And I think that the professor in the first part of the lesson said a lot about learning by interacting, informal learning, social ties that are involved uh, in the technology transfer and learning uh, how to use technology. So as also the presentation was more focused on China, we are going to explain mainly this paper and also raise some questions. The aim of the paper was to investigate innovation and learning capabilities in Chinese company. The idea is to go a bit behind the usual economic model and look also what there is inside technology, like what means technology. Um, for doing so, the professor, based on theories such as evolutionary theory, national system of innovation theory or regulation theory, which are all theory that see the complementarity between institution in making a system that then allowed technological learning. The methodology, as the professor said, was a directive and qualitative observation made uh, uh, and also um, like he used national and local statistics between 998 and 2003. The idea of the paper, I, I hope I really understood it, is really like, there is not, uh, this is the, um, the system national, let's say that this is the national system of innovation of China. What happened? Okay, before we are speaking about informal learning, interaction by company, foreign and Chinese company, how we create technological know how. The problem in China, like the professor said, that the problem in China that was that this informal learning was not really embedded in a national system of innovation. Because from the 1980, we have a, re a growing domestic primary level demand, really huge, uh, and what which push first of all small private Chinese enterprise with low technology and small workshops to burn. Then th a lot of these private enterprise burn, and and then there are other Chinese, uh, Taiwanese, and Hong Kong companies that add to the market with also using cheap labor and having a little bit of more global demand but still not really having a high technological level and then foreign companies. <coughs> All these, let's say, um, private new environment that create was basically uh, based on the competition for low price market, which means that they were trying to produce as cheap as possible without really being involved in learning, uh, in improving technology. And this basically leads uh, to a low, uh, like a high competition and light cooperation for capability development. So the growth, the general growth of China was much, much, not really an evolution from, a, let's say, a small and not really technological firm to a more technological one, but was much more um, a continuous uh, emerging of different productive system one up to the other um, with informal learning. While where there is all this system growing, there are still the national enterprise, which are actually the center, like the focus of the national system of new innovation, in the sense that financial system, government policy, sense of technology institution, where at the government level, where all 
I'm, at, for example, like um, in investment from the bank, we're really redirected to this firm. Also, government policy, we're aimed at creating a, a planned economy for making them more competitive. And also, all these science technological institution um, to um, let the technology from the foreign company to be absorbed were mainly finalized at creating uh, uh, improving national enterprise. What is the fact? That the fact is that actually the informal learning and the really interaction between actors was happening in the private sector and not anymore in the national one. So it means that the, like, the main reason why the growth of China uh, according to the professor is not like for example other of Korea or Japan is that because there is this completely fraction like fraction between the national system and the developing uh, new firm base on in uh, informal learning so um, okay so maybe ah, as the professor have already said the for the development in these industry, mainly the private China, uh, private China and enterprise of small dimension, were really based on local uh, institution and local help, which is something that I'm going to ask also during the question because I hadn't really, like, I didn't really un understand how a local government can help while the national government is really not really, uh, is against the, so I'm going to also ask a little bit about it. Uh, but all in all, like the, the idea of the paper is basically this one, that all the system of innovation was made for national enterprise. Um, uh, okay, so then now I'm going to make some comments uh, and, and raise some questions, because then my uh, Juju uh, is going to make maybe some other comment because she is from the region, so maybe she has some other question more based on uh, experience, practical experience. So I, I really find really interesting the idea of, like the idea of inquiring the black box of technological change in China because usually in the economic model is something that is left a bit apart. Also, I really find really interesting the, I had read before the article about uh, informal learning and then the fact that this informal learning can be embedded in institution and the, the problem in China was this one I really like, I don't know a lot about China, but I found it really interesting. I was thinking that in the article, also related to the one the professor wrote this year about developing technological learning in developing country, I was thinking that there was not so much about the way how it worked in the informal um, uh, learning, but actually the professor said a lot now, making a lot of examples. I think it was more a overall systemic explanation. So I was really curious how culture and social ties were like affecting the technological learning, and also how the, for example, are we? I often heard and also read some paper about Confucian culture, how it actually. Also, you have been in many places, so it could be really interesting to know how the different play have a different approach to our, the interaction with new actors. Um, also then I was curious because I, okay, I found many papers also of uh, like in Chinese uh, website that were like from the paper, I understood that actually there is now a aim from the government to, to help these new mm -hmm. small and medium enterprise or small system of innovation that is growing. So, I, and also something that you mentioned uh, during the, no, you mentioned in the article is mm -hmm. that the government tried to make the finance uh, tools n more available for national uh, enterprise and not really a lot for other private enterprise. And indeed, I was finding a lot about the fact that the problem is that these small enterprises are high risky, so the bank don't really want to uh, invest. So I was thinking how much is due to the government uh, decision and how much is due to just the economic uh, situation uh, and related to economic risk. Then also here I found other article speaking about a national system that actually is 
now growing with cluster, science park and incubators. I wanted to know to what extent, because the, the article is written um, after the time uh, the data were collected. So I was thinking if you know something about the change or why are you actually changing. Um, then, okay, um, also this is also related how, how, to what extent the government interfere with the foreign company because also other article that they found, uh, I quite find the fact that the government try to, to have foreign company to have technological know-how. So I will, because from the article seems that they actually try to avoid foreigner investor to be in the country, or maybe I understood, I didn't do this proper, properly, so I wanted to <coughs> know this. Uh, and also, okay, I found the basic uh, idea of the article that was also, also that innovation was not happening because the competition, there was this competition for the low price market. And so no one was really uh, worried about investing for improving the quality of the product. And I was thinking to what extent competition couldn't be indeed the reason because I found an article we were saying that there was a high quality market and a low quality market and the both market were trying to catch the middle market so that also the really low technological firms were trying to develop more technological skill. So maybe uh, this and then okay I just add now as you said your about your works and your experience I really would like to know how one can take this path because I think it's really interesting and also how it work actually the the research on field like when you go and and you, and you what you do during a day or what. <laughs> so thank you and now I'm going to yeah. <laughs> thank you so much uh, and thank you very much for your brilliant uh, presentation and actually uh, my personally I'm from Guangzhou and I live in Guangzhou, the capital of this province. Um, for to be honest, I didn't visit a lot of places as you did <laughs> to to do those other case studies. However, there's still some questions to me because I listened to your presentation, and I just focus on your case study experience, which is amazing. However, uh, there's a question uh, getting to my mind, which is uh, because you are always visiting all those manufacturing factories. So, which means um, it's only for manufacturing. It's mm -hmm. not actually um, a factor of R&D, in, in my opinion. Mm. So, um, I want to say it's like no cities want to be the second Detroit. <laughs> so, uh, in, in a sense, I would like to introduce another, uh, actually, my partner has already said uh, a cluster and science part in Guangdong. Mm -hmm. uh, I have checked the paper, which uh, you have you have mentioned only one company in Shenzhen, which is the, actually the most developed science park in Guangdong province. So, uh, in my understanding, probably those case study in your research is not very representative. <laughs> Just a personal view. Um, so, what in my understanding in uh, science park in Shenzhen? Uh, which uh, maybe I should do a little bit more introduction for this province because maybe most of you don't really understand <laughs> what, it, what it happens. Okay, so in China we have three main regions of like you can say developed regions Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. Uh, Guangzhou is actually Canton. Canton is the province uh, adjacent to Hong Kong. So actually the development of Guangdong province is based on the um, you can say technology transfer or all those foreign direct in uh, investment from Hong Kong and Macau region, which you know uh, used to be a, a colony of uh, Britain and Spain. Uh, no, sorry, Portugal. Portugal. Yeah. So uh, in my region, uh, I can say that it's a region of immigration. Uh, lots of people immigrate to foreign countries and they came back because they love this country, they love this region, and they bring back all this technology and knowledge. Um, so uh, from this case study in uh, Guangdong region, I don't see very representative because they are studying cases in very small cities, even those cities I, I've never been. <laughs> so there are only manufacturing factories, in my understanding. 
Uh, so the center of R&D is exactly uh, located in Shenzhen region, Shenzhen city. That's the city uh, next to Hong Kong. And right now, actually, we can see that there's a really great development in, in that region. Uh, we, a part of the Silicon Valley in the United States, moved uh, move their headquarters to Shenzhen region. Um, so it make it a hex. I can maybe you can check it. H A X is a hex. Um, yeah, cluster science part. Uh, hex you can interpret it into hardware um, accelerator. Actually, it's a in in K how is it? An incubator and accelerator in this region. And mainly, as we we know that it's a cluster industry. We're focusing in the hardware industry. So we're building a robot, we're building some uh, little element of aircraft, and we're building like a fox, foxen for iPhone, every people using your iPhone in pocket. Okay, so uh, in this region, uh, we have this science part, hacks. Um, how does this work? Actually, uh, according to a professor, we have very seldom uh, government support, but actually that's not true. Um, in Hex Park, um, uh, we can say that majority of the people, they, they don't really work in the innovation. Uh, not that they don't really work only in innovation. <laughs> uh, half of the, the time, they work in other companies. Uh, for example, those manufacturing factors or uh, Tenshin, Huawei, actually we see these two brands, these two biggest brands as the last generation brand. Um, because it's a little bit out of fashion. Um, however, they have a really good reputation in internationally speaking. Um, most of these people, they work half of the, their time in these kind of international companies and uh, use the rest of their time working in their own projects, which is a startup in hacks. And how do they found their own projects? Uh, mainly, we are copying. <laughs> the way uh, from US as well. We have our, uh, maybe people know that the uh, star keep, uh, what's the name again? Um, Kickstarter mm -hmm. in US, which is quite famous. We have the same project in China as well. And for government part, what can I see from the government support this way? Uh, we have a lot of scholarship from the government, you know. As I say, there are lots of immigration or foreign studies students so uh, for our government, we have a plan which is called Thousand People Plan, which support those foreign students um, earning three years scholarship, and then they have to they sign a contract, and they have to get back to China for the innovation stuff or for the research. Um, yeah, so that's how it works. And um, so that's my first um, comment on Maybe it's only about the um, case study, probably, in my opinion. Uh, please, okay, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the high tech. Um, how to say, um, actually, I have some, I have lots of friends who is working in uh, this science part. And also, I have some friends working in the government, and even one of my uncle is a chief of, like, several departments. For example, in, in France, it's, it won't be possible that like, you're a chief in Bank of France and the um, labor department, but in China, that's possible. <laughs> Why? Because um, probably in China, the government will focus more on the execution instead of their policy making. Uh, how, why should I say that? Because, uh, for example, my uncle, he used to be a soldier. He never know anything about economics or something like that, but he's a great executor, <laughs> of course, as a soldier, he should be. Um, so he could, what he really cares is only the red title documents from the national um, assignment. So it makes him really efficient to execute <coughs> all those policies. Uh, however, probably those policies is not quite related to this region's development. Um, but that's true, that's one of the limitations we can say that for Chinese innovation development. Uh, and the other point for this national innovation system, 
And I would like to say, for example, the region I mentioned before, the Shenzhen region, he, he's actually, uh, this is actually a city directly controlled by a nation. It's not directly controlled by our region. So it's a little bit different in the policy making, so it's a bit complicated to say whether the government is helping or not. So, mm, okay. And, and also about the high tech or low tech, for example, this hacks, uh, I, I would have to say like majority of people, they are trying to make their applied technology into um, like industrialization of some, re not really high tech, maybe pseudo high tech. The government will support them because they can make this production, because they can, as you say, um, transfer this technology into production. However, probably they are not really high tech. Uh, for high tech stuff, it's like uh, government will give them a thousand of um, money in the R and D instead of like help them to produce. But that's true. Okay. Thank, you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we will take maybe the we will also gather the questions from the audience now because we could play to play and we have this sort of question. Okay. Answer. Okay. So, Alexander. Uh, my question was focusing on the e-commerce company that developed in competition, I guess, with Facebook, uh, Alibaba, mm -hmm. and uh, I was sort of wondering what kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer interactions go on in the framework of Alibaba and how that has really developed the Chinese uh, economy. And the second question following that is whether uh, there is any other international influence from let's say Europe or the United States, Africa, uh, Latin America, to use this uh, website to uh, make business with Chinese uh, entrepreneurs or government officials, I guess. Okay. Other questions? Yes, answer. My question is more or less um, a comparison between the China experience and Latin America. Because um, Latin America has been a focus on, on mostly from United States <coughs> to develop technology, let's say. But the idea that we learn differently, we act differently, so it's really interesting for me to see what did you grasp about this comparison on the learning technology. Okay. Yes. It's just a small question. No, no, no. <laughs> Very <easy. laughs> Short, 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 short. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gigantic issue. Sure. So you Sorry. talk about the te um, technology transfers between the foreign companies and local companies, mm -hmm. and how do you think this process is going on in China? Is the is the um, local companies cooperating successfully, or there has been few linkages because of cultural issues and that you mentioned? Maybe if you can change in order for the camera not to go back, then it will switch to face. Thank you very much for the comments. Um, yeah, the, the was, there was, uh, um, in the process of, uh, after the opening policy, uh, in the early 80s and until the years 2000, there was what we, Zhao Wei and myself, have called um, piling up of productive systems. Uh, the first paper that we did had this... Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, there was, there was a, a graphic now. There was a graphic uh, of, of a sort of, uh, uh, which uh, I, uh, I can just, just show you like that. It's not very, it's, it's just to show. There was this graphic, which uh, sort of piling historical, like, like stratas mm -hmm. inside the, inside the, the, the ground no, of the evolution of the companies. So you had sort of, the first companies that appeared as private companies, uh, which were called the Chinese ma miracle, was all these rural small companies that emerged everywhere. 
uh, as soon as uh, it was possible to create private, uh, private businesses. But there were very small ones. There were rural companies and mainly focused on, on doing uh, um, agricultural products and bringing agricultural products to the market. They were very essential because they were the ones that created all this, uh, all this uh, money background that was able to fuel afterwards investments in larger companies. So they had been very, very essential in the sense that they fixed the norms of the market mechanisms. Then you had this uh, series in the 90s, this, the first and, and, and since then, in, in without interruption, uh, investments of foreign uh, Chinese from, from overseas. Chinese from overseas were very important and you had not one industrial city in the whole China that did not have at that time the hotel for the Chinese for the foreign, uh, from overseas. <coughs> You had everywhere locations, offices specifically oriented at inviting the overseas Chinese to invest locally. And then you had a sort of uh, a third strata that appeared, which were these uh, private companies that were either born out of the collective companies that existed beforehand, that, that spread, as I, I said, the story of the corsets and all that, which is a very common story. It's not specific. To this, to this place, um, and uh, and uh, you had also at the same time the privatization of public research R and D centers. Let me give you an example. There is an electronic research center in Guangzhou, which uh, was uh, doing um, electronic equipment uh, included in satellites, that, but. Can, it's sort of sort of chips that can enter into the satellites. Um, they were also doing radio radio um, uh, circuits that can be integrated in a normal radio and so on and so forth. They were a public uh, research center, and they were marketized as it was called at that time. So they were transformed into a private entity. And they made a lot of money very quickly. One of the things that made them ha earn a lot of money is that they designed a small circuit for this machine where you pay uh, you pay for uh, for uh, for to enter in some place. So you have a card, and you pass it, and it recognizes your card. They had designed the, the, the circuit for that. So they earned a lot of money, and their main client was the city of uh, the, 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 the government, the infrastructure uh, bureau of the government of Guangdong because they wanted to have uh, payments to enter the bridges, for example. At some time, the bridges were, you had to pay to cross the bridges, the new bridges. You had also to pay to enter some of the, some of the highways, where also you had to pay for some highways. And so all, this, all these things, allowed this uh, small research center, which was something like 30 persons, not, not much more than that, to become a very important uh, uh, research center. And, and it partly re answers your, your question. Uh, I visited Huawei, by the way. And at that time, uh, if my memory is not bad, I think it's it's even described in this one. Uh, if my memory is not so bad, they had something like 10,000 employees. They had, in the 10,000 employees, they were, had something like 8,000 engineers that were below 30 years old. They had three research centers, one in Texas, one in Sweden, and one in Shenzhen. Um, and what made Huawei what it is today is, of course, is continuous support by the government because they are making the um, telecommunication without, without wire, so the army paid all the time for the development. They had a 10 years issue with Cisco because the servers were pirated from Cisco. They ended up recognizing it and made a deal with Cisco because Cisco had no, at the end, had more advantage in having Huawei using a, a Chinese version of their of their of their 4G servers instead of having the ones that they were 
under the name of Cisco. Uh, and, and part of the, that, that was the job of the, of, the, of the research, they had a research and development center that was based in Texas, and that was one of the reasons of the existence of the research and development center was to pirate the, the technology in the US. Um, and they had a joint venture with Ericsson, where they, where they acquired part of the technology for, for telecommunications. And, and, this, and in this process, um, they had standard support from the government all along. So they are really an exception. As probably all the companies, the Chinese companies that have had large, being large companies with continuous growth, they are, all of them are exceptions. The general rule is a private company that arrives to certain growth and then sort of impossible to go above. One of the difficulties was the banking system, which is not private in China, <coughs> public banks. All of the banks belong to the government. And all the markets are run by the banks. So the show is is completely controlled by the government. So this is the way you control the whole policy. Mm -hmm. So you can have local policies on the development on the ground for to develop technical centers, competence centers, technical schools, engineering schools, whatever of that. Try to promote uh, linkages with companies, create offices to link uh, foreign students with, uh, with, uh, with, local, with local companies. Uh, all the mayors of the larger cities in Guangdong, but this is not also only in Guangdong, everywhere, uh, they organized every year um, a dinner where the foreign Chinese are, uh, students are invited to come to the dinner and the local government proposes them jobs or to facilitate them the acquisition of papers. When you come back from a foreign country and you're a Chinese student that has lived for some years in a foreign country, it's usually bit complicated to relocate. Uh, so so they, they help on this, this kind of aspect. So there is a conscious policy to support uh, human competences. And on the ground, locally, you can have these policies that express uh, on specific, uh, specific items that concern human resources, but financial resources, and so on and so forth. But it's not an integrated policy, or it wasn't an integrated policy. It becomes the thing is very different when the technology is interesting the central government. So there you have standard support for all the t all the aspects of the development of the company, and a, and a company like Huawei, Huawei will never have financial problems. Never, not not in a dream. So so that's bit. Of easier of a thing. Of course, Huawei needed at that time when I when I visited Huawei in the early 2000s, they needed to prove that they can do this. So this confidence with the government policy is not earned on the on the offset. You you, you need to you need to, to build it up. But once it is, it's done. I mean, as you maybe know, Huawei, the first market of Huawei, or maybe you don't, the first market of Huawei was telecommunication in Xinjiang, in the, in, the, in the west, northwest part of China, where the distances are gigantic. And so they, that's where they tested the first satellite communications and the mastering of the servers of the satellite communications. The next market was Zimbabwe, because they learned how to manage a telephone system. The next market was, after Zimbabwe, was Thailand where they learn to manage a complex telephone system, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So the strategy has been always to go from more simple and less demanding markets to higher and more demanding markets in a quite a, a regular pattern of consolidating the competences, and at the same time, they're consolidating their, their, their technical basis locally. Um, what, what is the, 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 the relation with this, uh, the cultural aspect in the learning process? I never talk of culture. I don't think I pronounced no, the word. No, sorry, maybe I No, I know, you times. did it. Okay. But I didn't. And I have a reason for that. Whatever the country, the same process happens. Now, it can take different forms. 
but 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 it it still is a, a social process a process of constructing a social basis of relations where technology makes sense mm -hmm. and this of course would be different if you do it in in mexico or if you do it in china but it won't it won't be uh, more or less efficient in one or the other country because of cultural aspects. Curiously, in the literature, there was a lot of this discussion about culture. Is there, is there an Asian culture of learning, for example? Is there a specific Chinese Confucian, for example, way of being obedient? And so you organize your workforce more. It's probably more material aspects, like how many companies you have, how many people you have to manage, and what are your physical constraints in terms of, of organizing your, your, mesh, your, your productive system that, that play an important role. As far as uh, you can go with the case studies, which is never very far because it's specific case studies, in each case what you see is that over time, you build, over time, you build a social basis. And it's because you have this social basis that you have the rest. So that, 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 that would be my answer about this dilemma about cultural, social, and what, what happens with the economy in, in, in that, concerning technology transfers. Um, there was a question about technology transfers, uh, which is, uh, uh, what kind of uh, technology transfers happen or don't happen. As I mentioned at the beginning of the conference, uh, the debate about technology transfer ended somewhere at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. And the reason why is that everybody understood that, in fact, what you transfer is not transferable. <coughs> you have to recreate locally the technological conditions of using the technology. So what happens? Things can be very different if the deals you make with those who provide you with the knowledge you don't have uh, are, pa are your partners. And it's different if they are partners and how much partners they are. Uh, do you integrate them into your business or do you just give them a license? Do you just want them to provide you as part of it? Let me give you an example. You know this uh, film, the cling film, the plastic that's so thin no? that you, you used to make, uh, to wrap up things. Um, yeah, sort of like self, very thin cellophane. It's a sort of polymer, it's a complex polymer usually. Uh, the machine that, uh, you need just one machine to do this, which costs something like two million euros more or less. It's one and a half, between one and a half to two million euros. Uh, when I left uh, Guangzhou in 2004, there was 14 of these machines in Guangdong. Uh, so there was 14 companies, there was only one provider at that time. In fact, there's only two companies that knew how to produce this machine, this specific machine. Uh, it, it was a German company that was uh, then uh, bought by the French and then the French sold it back to the, to the Germans. And there's only three companies in the world that do that. One of their main clients is Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, and all that, because they wrap up these uh, gigantic quantities of cellophane <laughs> to wrap up. But they also sell to the supermarkets, the one that you buy. And, uh, so it's, in fact, it's a large machine that takes, I don't remember how much, uh, 10, 10 or 15 meters long, that you put the plastic on one side. At the end, there is sort of gigantic roll that gets out the, the thin layer of plastic. And the setup of this thing needs six months to set up one of these machines. To glue things like that. You don't need a lot of technical people to do to have it work. You need more people to set it set it set it up. The the guys, the technical people, the foreign people that were involved into doing that, they lived there for six months with their families, with their so they become acquainted, they get married with the Chinese <coughs> lady, they, get, uh, they have kids. Uh, one of my best friends is, is a Chinese married with one of these technical guys. Uh, so so they, they live there, they, they completely integrate. And part of their know-how is developed with the Chinese technical people that does, that does the, the thing. 
And on paper, they just bought a machine and it was just sold with the contract of maintenance. That's all. That's what the paper says. What the reality is, is that if they don't have this interaction, you just don't produce the bloody clean film. You need, you need to have this very intensive interaction to take place. And one, probably one of the qualities of what happened in China at that time, and probably yet to today also, is that this integration of foreign people into the local conditions was relatively easy. So, so everybody found it relatively easy a way to manage this kind of thing, which makes me think again that culture has nothing to do. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. But it's okay. so. This is one way you can do this technology transfer process. There's another way, which is what the automobile companies do. They do joint ventures with a foreign company, and and try to build together the cl the cars using some rules that are that are elsewhere. The difficulties there are not very different from producing a car in any part of the world under whatever conditions you have. The joint venture system, which was not very much favored by the foreign companies, they would have preferred to be their own companies and that, uh, in fact produced a competence in China concerning how to build parts of cars, bits and parts. Uh, Chou Chou, for example, the first Chinese car, the first real Chinese car, which was built by a Chinese uh, 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 private company and not a public company, because all these joint ventures were with public Chinese companies and some foreign constructor, uh, Volkswagen, uh, Citroën, uh, Nissan, and so on and so forth. Uh, what, uh, what, happened, what happened with Chou Chou is very funny. Chou Chou is a provider for Volkswagen in Shanghai. And one day, they just lose the market, because they don't produce the quality that Volkswagen needs. And so he has tons of bits and parts of cars. So he decides to build up his own car just to get rid of all the things that he has accumulated. And, and it works. Uh, the, 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 way, the, way you, uh, the reason it works is because they are very acquainted with what happens in producing a car. It's they don't just produce a part of the car. They also know what the assembly of a car, an assembly line looks like. They know the constraints, they know it's complicated, they know what, what is going to be difficult or not. They know they'll have problems with security and norms and things and that. They just test it. And that's also maybe one of the qualities of the Chinese market is that you can produce whatever. After you test it for a time, either it works or not, but you test it first you, before you, you, you apply the rule uh, of testing. So the way you do the transfer depends very much on how much intense is your interaction with the company that is implementing the technology. Um, uh, but the, 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 the internet and so on, I have no clue. It's a very good subject. I recently was on the panel of a doctoral thesis on internet in Guangzhou on the uses of internet and so on. Um, one of the uh, things that uh, the Chinese government for political reasons did was to try to prevent the growth of Facebook, uh, Google, and so on in China uh, and, and support the creation of local uh, companies. Alibaba is a very old venture because it exists since 1995, I think, something like that. So it's a very old venture and it accompanied uh, the Providers, industrial providers market, manufacturers. Uh, in particular, Chinese small companies which were dispersed and used Alibaba to sell their products to whomever who wanted to, to buy them. Uh, I was working a, at a, a time with a, a guy from Mongolia and uh, we were locating cheap telephones. And we were using Alibaba to locate the, the, the producers. I mean, of course, the, the place to be where you wanted, if you wanted to know who were the providers. But usually, the main users there were these small companies I was talking about in my lecture. I mean, the, the main, the main uh, user of Alibaba has been, uh, Alibaba now is a gigant, you know, so they sell everything and, and they have parts. And, but at that time, when they were really a sort of 
B2B uh, system, uh, they accompany these small businesses that are aching to grow and have difficulty in growing and looking for markets and so on. The companies that really grew were the companies that had local support. It was, or in the case of strategic technologies like Huawei, and companies that had national support. But companies that grew really, even public companies that grew and became well known or broke the limit of uh, 300 employees, which is more or less the limit of a, a small company in, in China, are companies that have had the local support of the local government, the industrial bureau it's called, or it's called whatever. Not, not, not the companies that are in incubators or in the science and technology parts, which never serve nothing. Uh, and really the growth has really been direct support from the local governments to the companies. And this, this is probably, and uh, Gene Oi has called this um, uh, local corporatism. Uh, Jean Oi is one of the big specialists. She's, a, she, she's a, an American that lives all her life in China. Uh, and she really has investigated in the north of China and a lot of regions. And, uh, you know, Unger and, and, um, and uh, Mrs. Chen, I don't remember her name, uh, her first name, when they did also uh, the, the studies in one of the, uh, the villages I visited, uh, which was uh, specialized in textiles, uh, can, has, has verified the same thing. The local government created a sort of structure that supports the local businesses. It has direct interest in doing that. The functioners, the people who work in the office, are investors in the company. This co direct collusion, if not corruption, between the functioners, the local governments, and the companies. And that has been undercover. It has been what really functioned. And in the south of China, it functioned because it was also the same families. It was, not, it was inside the same clans. It was not only the same functionaries from the same, the same public officials from the same, it was also the public. Now, the, the, the limit of this is how much of what you produce is acceptable, not on the market, but to the, to the public infrastructure, to public administrative structure that you have. That, that's where, for example, uh, large, large cities like the ones in the south of Guangzhou that had uh, financial issues with the crisis, uh, the, the ones that survived were the ones also that accepted to, 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 to rule all this chaotic system and to try to limit the degree of, uh, of, of participation of the public people into the private businesses. This has been a difficult issue and it has always been one of the sensible issues that's when when I talk about corruption, usually it's because one clan is against another. It's not about corruption. <laughs> um, but it's ha it has been one of, one of the difficulties. Um, what's the comparison one could make with Latin America and China? I'm still wondering. Mm -hmm. um, we, I, I published a special issue uh, in Science Technology Society, which is a, a journal specialized on these issues a special issue on technological learning in Latin America. That was in 95 or something like that, I remember. Uh, and I invited uh, a student to, to, to write a paper uh, which was on the growth of uh, the maquiladora industry in the north of Mexico. Maquiladora's industry, we were called Sanjo in China, uh, the three commands in, in Chinese. Uh, it's companies that have a special fiscal status, that don't pay taxes locally to produce, and that assemble for a foreign provider to re-export to, uh, to this foreign provider in a foreign market. Uh, in China, it, has been, it, it also existed for at least 10 years as a legal status in the south of China, in particular in in the Macau and, and, and South region, but also in, in all the, in Zhongshan, for example, district, has been a lot of these, um, particularly Zhongshan district, which is very good at doing that. Uh, and the city of Zhongshan is living, has for a long time lived on, 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 on doing these maquiladoras. On the frontier of Mexico with the United States, you have also maquiladoras, and they are probably the ones responsible for the industrial growth of Mexico, 
of large part of Mexico. Um, so the same kind of policies have been applied in the different uh, in, the, in, in the in the different cases. Uh, what probably has been very different uh, for what I saw on the ground at the level of the local, let's say, medium-sized national comp national capital companies, uh, is that the Chinese companies were eagerly seeking a contact with a foreign provider, with a foreign client. As I said before, they use that as a way to include technology to uh, to uh, uh, to to get hold of the technology without having to to steal, copy it, and which is doing it with interaction with a, with a, and you can do that in in more mature areas. It's easier to do without having to invest a lot in students, in PhDs, in research and development, and so on and so forth. So it's more direct. When you get to higher level technology, for example, nanotechnology, like uh, Romain Birono when he did his study on under my, partly under my supervision, he's a student that died recently. So we did a book in his honor. And, and he studied nanotechnologies in China. And he was finding, for example, that the nanotechnology sector, a large part of the contacts that were developed and the, and the patents that were developed were developed by foreign uh, companies that had contacts with foreign uh, clients in the same way. I think the thing about the Chinese companies was that they were obsessed by getting hold of the technology, which was not the case in Latin America. Um, and even uh, then, you, you had always sort of, uh, we had an analysis of, of uh, the chemical sector, for example. For many years, I worked with the chemical sector in, in Venezuela and then in Mexico. And we reproduced the same, we reproduced the same survey uh, in the chemical sector, also in Brazil and, and Mexico at the national level and uh, Venezuela. And you had a more or less sort of distribution of the whole sector. One third of the companies just do business as usual and don't really want to develop. One third of the companies try to develop all the technology by themselves. And some 10 to 15% of the companies uh, try to develop the technology with some foreign foreign provider, and then um, you, the, this the part that's very active, that that the more active technologically were national based capital, national capitals, were not foreign companies that had intense connection and relations with their clients and their providers. So this is not very different in any way, in any place, but probably the proportion of small companies in China doing this consciously, going to look for a client and using the client as his provider of technology, this is probably very specific to China. Okay, no more questions. So thank you very much. Thank you.